Nixborough, 1974. The Nipro chemical plant explodes. This woman described the disaster five hours before it happened. Chicago, 1979, the crash of American Airlines Flight 191. David Booth claims he foresaw every detail in his dreams. Can some people really see into the future? April 1912, the Titanic tragedy was also predicted. What can explain such knowledge of things to come? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, scientist, writer, and visionary. The scientist who invented the communication satellite, the writer of 2010, and now in retreat in Sri Lanka, the visionary who ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. I've never had a premonition, and I rather hope I never do. But they're quite common, and a very good example occurred to a good friend of mine many years ago here in Sri Lanka. He was in charge of a brickworks here in the jungle, and one day when he was leaving for his office, the foreman came up to him and said, please, master, drive carefully. Something bad is going to happen. So my friend drove carefully, and nothing bad happened. However, when he got to his office, there was a message, please return at once. When he got back to the work site, he found that the foreman, the man who just warned him, was dead, killed in a freak accident. There'd been blasting at a quarry almost a mile away. A stone had been hurled this unprecedented distance, passed through a small gap in the roof, hit the man on the head, and killed him instantly. So he had seen an omen. What he had not seen was that it forecast his own death. Such cases are quite common and very puzzling. But do they really foretell the future? Chicago, May the 25th, 1979. Minutes after the crash of an American Airlines DC-10. 273 passengers are dead. The disaster shocked America. Yet 10 days earlier in Cincinnati, David Booth had foreseen it in a dream. I looked up in the sky, and there's an American Airlines jet. I don't know what kind it was. I didn't know planes that well. And the first thing that struck me about it, you know, where I was and looking at it, was that it wasn't making the sound that it should. You know, for being so close to me, it should be louder than it was. But it was flying like this, and then all of a sudden, it goes like this. It turns over on its back, and then goes straight down on the ground. He woke up one morning and he was in tears, very nervous, very upset. And I said, well, Dave, what is wrong? And he says, I've had this dream. He says, I don't know where it is or what's going on. He said, but the plane goes up in the air. And he says, then it banks off to the right, goes down nose first, and explodes. And he says, everybody gets killed. And I said, well, Dave, it's just a dream. You know, I said, don't let it upset you. You know, everybody has dreams. And I thought about it all day, and, you know, what can I do about it? And I went home that night, and normal, everything. Went to sleep. Next day, it happened again. You know, and I woke up. I didn't cry this time. You know, I'm saying, you know, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, what's going on here? Kept going on every night. Paul Williams of the Federal Aviation Administration was telephoned at Cincinnati Airport by a distraught David Booth on May the 24th. He remembers that phone call the day before the crash. In his dream, what he reported to me was that the aircraft suddenly turned sharply to the right and then dived into the ground. And he described in great detail the uh, explosion that he saw. And, uh, uh, and every time he described that, he uh, became quite distraught because it was almost as if he was seeing death. The next night, David Booth saw this film of the air crash on the television news. The first thing that came on with was, you know, was the air crash in Chicago. You know, I'm looking at it, and I lost it then. You know, I'm looking at this thing, you know, this is what I've been dreaming about. You know, the whole thing. And I looked at Dave, and it was just like he turned white as a ghost. 
He was, you know, it was almost like in shock. Pictures snatched by an amateur photographer show how the plane crashed. It had lost an engine and rolled over before hitting the ground and exploding. When he learned the facts, Paul Williams realized that David Booth's dream was uncannily accurate. The coincidences between what David Booth told me on May 24th and what actually happened on May 25th uh, were the airline was exactly correct, the type of aircraft was as he described, a large aircraft with an engine on the tail, which a DC-10 is. The aircraft was not making the right sound, and he described that to me on May 24th. Perhaps the most remarkable coincidence of the whole thing was the uh, similarities of the maneuver that the plane made. It's a very unusual maneuver for uh, a plane to make before crashing. Uh, most of them uh, crash with wings horizontal. They uh, run into some obstruction, uh, uh, a mid-air collision. But the maneuver that David described was very unusual. As a matter of fact, it's the only one I've ever heard of, of a plane that size. Does Williams believe David Booth had a vision of the future? All I can say is I don't know. If David told me that a plane was going to, uh, a certain plane was going to crash, uh, I certainly wouldn't get on the plane. 40 years before the Titanic sailed on her maiden voyage in 1912, writer Morgan Robertson had forecast her fate in a novel. Like Titanic, his ship, the Titan, hit an iceberg and sank. One passenger on the Titanic believes a premonition saved her life. Eva Hart, seven years old in 1912, was emigrating to Canada with her parents. But her mother was convinced the ship was doomed. She begged her husband not to go on board, but he confidently brushed aside her fears. Eva remembers her mother's last minute plea. When we were going up the actual gangway to get on this ship, she made another, yet another plea with him not to go. And he was carrying me, he turned and looked at her and he said, well, this is ridiculous. He said, if you feel as badly as that about it, perhaps you'd better go home to your mother and I'll go on my own and you can follow when you see I've got there quite safely. And of course, she wouldn't do this. And so each night she would change her clothes from whatever she'd been wearing for dinner in the evening and get into a warm woolen dress and her shoes and everything and sit down in the cabin to read or to sew or knit and remain wide awake the whole night. And on this particular night, when this dreadful thing happened, she'd got this glass of orange juice on the table by the side of her bunk and she said it was very full and so small was this bump, which she always described as being like a train pulling into a station, it didn't even slop the orange juice over the top. And so anyone else would have thought it was just a little thing, it wouldn't matter, but to her, she knew this was the thing that was the end of everything for her. Mrs Hart woke her husband, who went up to the boat deck. And he came back quite quickly, and he just said to her, you better put this sick coat on, I'll put another one on. And she just looked at him and he put this coat on her. And do you know, years afterwards, I would say to her sometimes, I can't understand when he came back into the room why you didn't say to him, what is it, what's the matter? You wakened him, you sent him up on deck. And in that lovely calm voice that my mother had, she would say, there was nothing to ask him. I didn't have to ask him what it was. I didn't know it was an iceberg, but I knew it was this something. Benjamin Hart went down with the ship. But Eva's mother saved her little girl because she'd been expecting disaster. And if my mother hadn't been sitting up that night, I wouldn't be here now. I owe my life to her premonition. Don't I? Lake Tahoe, Nevada. One of the great gambling towns of America. Hopeful punters come here to Caesars Palace Casino in their thousands to play their hunches and the dollar fruit machines. A lot of nothing. Californian lawyer Jeff Randolph scooped the greatest jackpot in history in July 1981. $992,000. And he knew weeks in advance he was going to win. It's the highest amount of money that's ever been paid on a slot machine. This gentleman won it. He came $8,000 short of a million, so Caesar Tahoe decided to round it off to a cool million dollars. Randolph maintains luck played no part in his win. What is the first reaction when, when something like this hits? Uh, an unusual calm because I knew it was going to happen. Weeks earlier, Randolph had publicly announced he'd win the million. It was more than just a hunch. 
everybody thinks they're going to win. And most don't. I think mine was more than a hunch because I felt so strongly about coming up here. There were a series of things that I thought added up to a strong push to get up here to Caesars that weekend. Among others, I had begun telling people that I was going to win it that weekend. And I shaved for the second time in the day, which I had never done before. The first and only time I have ever done so was in the airplane on the way here that night, the night I won the money. I wanted somehow to look presentable and extra nice for all the pictures that were going to be taken after I won the money. Did they spell your name right, Jeff? Yes, they did. Yes. <laughs> Delicious. American President Abraham Lincoln dreamed he saw his own coffin in the White House. Only days later, in April 1865, assassin John Wilkes Booth gunned him down in a Washington theater. The dream had come tragically true. Another dream of the 1921 Grand National brought happier results. On Grand National Day in the London Daily Graphic, Columnist Hannan Swaffer reported that his friend Dennis Bradley had dreamed the result. Bradley said all the horses would fall except three. The winner would be wearing tartan colours. Every detail came true. Only three horses finished, and winner Sean Sparda carried tartan. In most cases, premonition anecdotes cannot be accepted as proof because they're usually told well after the event. Ideally, they should be written down and witnessed beforehand, so there's no possible doubt. And one man, a scientist, has attempted to do exactly that. Peter Fairley collected premonitions of the 1966 Aberfan disaster. Errol Mae Jones dreamed something black engulfed her school. Hours later, she and her friends died when a coal tip collapsed. Intrigued, Fairley founded the Evening Standard Premonitions Bureau. It had a simple function, that was, to take from anybody a telephone call, a letter, whatever it may be, some form of premonition, and to note it down and to put a time and a date to that and a signature from us as independent observers that that was what they said on that day at that time. And that's all that the Bureau did. I had one call from a man who had seen the winner of the Grand National. He had, was quite convinced that he had dreamed this, and the reason why it made an impact on him was that he had seen the colours of the jockey's blouse and had then checked and found that the horse that was bearing those colours was called Foynaven. And anybody who remembers that particular Grand National remembers that Foynaven was almost the only horse that finished. Watch the incredible pilot. Out of the shambles, one horse appeared, complete with rider, Foynaven. A complete outsider at 100 to 1, Foynaven cruised home exactly as predicted. During the course of all these replies that we had, there were some which were really very remarkable indeed. For instance, I've got some here. For instance, this, this is a woman who predicts that there will be hurricanes in Britain and that they will happen in January. Postmistress Karen Butler sent in the hurricane prediction. It had come to her vividly on the evening of November the 11th, 1967. Thank you. Well, I was sitting one evening reading, and I began mentally to get the impression of very strong winds. They were really dreadful winds, very, very strong. And I could see roofs just disintegrating and flying off. I could see trees and branches crashing down. I could see huts and sheds just flying through the air. And, um, I knew the winds were so strong, I said, it's a gale. No, it's not a gale, it's a hurricane. It's a hurricane. And then I said, oh, the people, the poor people. Well, my husband asked me, did I know where this was going to happen? And I said, I thought it was in Britain somewhere, but I didn't know exactly where. Then he asked me, did I know when it was going to happen? I said it would be the middle of the month of January. And on the 15th of January, a hurricane hit Glasgow. The city was devastated. Hurricanes are almost unknown in Britain, and the Premonitions Bureau sadly noted a hit. 
Now, we did begin to find one or two people who seemed to be scoring well above average regularly. In fact, we sort of called them our stars. And Lorna Middleton was one of them. Now, this is one of her early ones, and as so often happens, it looks rather vague. She says that she's got headaches and symptoms that usually precede earthquakes. But it was two days later that a really massive earthquake hit Skopje. Well, I, I really have a headache, uh, perhaps one or two a year. And uh, the, what I call my earthquake headache is a sharp pain which comes across the uh, forehead, either to the right, to the left, or left to right. The one I particularly remember was the uh, uh, Yugoslav earthquake, because I predicted that about 48 hours before. Uh, and that was um, sent because I had a sharp pain crossing my head. The problem with all these stars, as we called them, was that the moment that they started to know that we were interested in what they could do and we started to investigate how they did things, it just went. And that, I think, has, has de definitely come through all this to me as a, as a firm conclusion, that if there is such a thing as premonition, it is something which is instantaneous. It is, if you like, a flash of intuition. It doesn't take any time, and if you ask anyone to apply any conscious thought to it, it actually just goes. You might as well pretend it's not there. They are imagining after that. But if they suddenly have it happen to them, it could be. And the other conclusion is that when it happens to you, it is an overpowering sensation. You know that it's going to happen. No matter what it is and how unlikely it is, you know it's going to happen. Sadly, but not surprisingly, many premonitions aren't exactly what they appear to be. We all know how difficult it is to get the facts right and everyone loves to embroider a good story. Sometimes a careful investigation reveals a very different picture. I, I can see a little scenario, and it came first in, in my dreams right after he was elected. And it had to do with um, uh, a gun, and it had to do with, with shots all over the place. Professional psychic Tamara Rand made this prediction about President Reagan on American TV. As I initially felt, I felt it might, might actually be an assassination attempt or a shot to the president. March the 30th, 1981. Tamara Rand's prediction looked horribly accurate. Yet appearances were deceptive. In fact, the recording was made not on January the 6th, but on March the 31st, 24 hours after the event. In December 1978, American student Richard Newton predicted 45 people would die in a plane crash on March the 11th. And on the 14th of March, 47 people did die at Gatter in the Persian Gulf. He'd also forecast the plane would have red on its tail. And he was right. Yet Newton claimed no psychic powers. He just worked it out from statistics that anyone could find in books. First, he noted that the majority of airlines have some red in their logos. You'll see that more than half have red somewhere in their logos. For instance, uh, American Airlines, Alitalia, TWA, JAL, all have red in their logos. And Considering that half of these have red somewhere in their logos, it's a very safe bet to assume that a plane that crashes is going to have red in its logo somewhere. In this book is listed every plane crash for 25 years. I averaged the number of fatalities per crash over that 25-year period and found out that it averaged between 40 and 50. I chose 45, 47 were killed. As far as the time of the year of, the, of a crash, I drew this graph. And listed here are the number of crashes. And listed here are the months of the year in which crashes take place. And looking at this graph, you'll notice that March is tw twice as bad to fly in as May, with an average of about 4.6 crashes per month over that 25-year period. And averaging the month of March crashes here, you'll notice that the second week of March, or the Ides of March, are 
the worst time of the month in which to fly. So are there any true insights into the future? Most premonitions can undoubtedly be explained by coincidence. Even the most improbable events will occur if you wait long enough. The question is, how long is enough? Somebody once said that the laws of chance do not merely permit coincidences, they compel them. We've all had examples of this. Perhaps the commonest is when you think of somebody and five minutes later, they call you up on the telephone. Yet other premonitions may involve something more. They may be subconscious foresight, warnings of some danger that the senses have detected, but which we are not yet fully aware. No other explanation is necessary. Premonitions are warnings from our own minds, not from the future. Yet we should take them seriously because the dangers of which they speak may be perfectly real. So that's why I have a strange feeling whenever one of my friends tells me a premonition. Something bad may indeed be about to happen. On June the 1st, 1974, the Nipro chemical plant at Flixborough in Lincolnshire exploded. Disaster struck just before five. Yet one woman claimed she heard the details five hours earlier in a TV news flash which broke into the Saturday morning film. Leslie Brennan. At first, I didn't really take much notice of it because I was, you know, waiting for it to finish quick so I can get on with the film. And then I heard them mention the name Flixborough near Grimsby. And with that, I listened a bit closer to it. And they said there'd been this terrible explosion at Flixborough. There'd been a number of people injured, a number of people killed. Leslie told her friend Peter East the news when he came to lunch. I walked down to Leslie's house, which would be about 20 past 12 when I got there. Um, just after we got in, Leslie told us, you know, that there'd been an explosion. A news flash on television telling us about an explosion. And we thought no more about it until it came on the news at tea time and 10 o'clock. And um, then the reporters have said that it had happened at tea time. Well, we just sat back and laughed about it. <laughs> you know, it's like, mm, silly report has got it wrong again. You know, typical. <laughs> Dinner time, <laughs> or so we thought. But the reporters hadn't got it wrong. The plant went up at 4.53. How could Leslie have known five hours ahead? Well, five hours different from what Leslie told us. Leslie had seen it at 12 o'clock time, and it happened five hours later. You know, we couldn't believe it. <laughs> Um, I remember my friend, I can see her face now. She looked at me and said, oh, you know, <laughs> you told us about that at dinner time. I said, yes, I know. And I can remember feeling very, oh, made me feel queer, very cold and shaky. And I can remember getting this shiver all the way through me. And, um, really, I can't explain the feeling. It was unusual. In 1971, the submarine Artemis visited Grimsby the sailors were soon after the local girls. Sandra MacDonald was one. And I met one particular boy and we was with him for about two days till it sailed. And it sailed on the 17th, on a Thursday, it's June. And a week later, on the Wednesday, I had a dream on the night time. And in this dream, I saw a, like big grey stones, which I thought it was like a wall. And I thought that it was a harbour somewhere. And I actually saw the submarine sink. And I don't know how I knew, but there was three men trapped on board in the dream. The first person she told was her mother. She came down and she said, oh, Mum, I've had an awful dream. She said, uh, the Artemis sank with three men aboard. So I said, well, don't worry too much. It's because you've, you know, they've gone away. You've had a good time. And then a week later, which was the 30th of June, the submarine did actually sink. I was laid in bed reading, waiting for her to come home, and the uh, news flash came on the radio and said that the Artemis had sank. So when she came home from the dance, I called her into the bedroom and told her what had happened, and she just, I just, Sandra, that dream you had about the Artemis has come true. And she just broke down and cried, you know, because I think I upset her. When it came true, I was absolutely heartbroken because it frightened me. I mean, I'd never had anything like that before. And at first I thought my mum was joking till when she saw how upset I was and everything else. And as I say, we, we sat up most of the night listening to the bulletins for the radio, me and my mum together, to see if anybody had died on it, you know, because I thought it might be somebody I knew on board. 
Artemis had gone down in Portsmouth Harbour. The three men on board were rescued. Two of them were indeed friends of Sandra MacDonald. She's still unnerved by the accuracy of her dream. I didn't really understand it at first. I'd heard about premonitions, but I also thought it was somebody else. You know, I was quite sceptical about it, really. But um, obviously it does happen. Next week, things that go bump in the night.